My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the ancient city of Ephesus. I'm seated on ruins right in front of the great theater. This is the same theater that we read about in Acts chapter 19, where there was a big revolt against the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 24,000 people could sit in this theater. It was enormous, and it was one of the central features of the city. But in addition to the theater, there was a great church in this city. In fact, the church of Ephesus was the biggest congregation in the ancient world, started by the Apostle Paul with the help of his friends Aquila and Priscilla. Later on, Timothy was installed as the pastor of the church. And Paul wrote to Timothy two epistles. One is called 1 Timothy. The second is 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, I want to tell you what's going to be happening in the last days. Well, in Timothy's own time, society was quite a mess. Oh, it was dark. It was filled with moral chaos. But when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's nearly like the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul says, Timothy, if you think times are dark now, wait until you see what's going to happen at the end of the age. And of course, that's the time that you and I live in. Listen to what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This know also, oh, the Greek is so strong. It means emphatically know this, categorically know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Then in verse 2, the Holy Spirit begins enumerating what will be the chief signs of society at the very end of the age. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Wow. When I see the word blasphemers, I think about this theater behind me. Because in this theater, believers were brought on the stage and people blasphemed them, made fun of them, humiliated them, people denigrated them. But the Apostle Paul says at the end of the age, blasphemy is going to become widespread in society. In fact, the Holy Spirit lists it as one of the primary signs that we are living in the very end of the age. We need to know the signs that Jesus gave that lets us know he's about to return. And we need to know what the Bible says about these last days so we can survive them and thrive in them. And that is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. And we're looking at what the Holy Spirit prophesied would occur in society at the very end of the age. And I want to remind you, the Holy Spirit says nothing to scare us but he's very interested in preparing us. And that's why he gave us 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is so powerful. And I want you to order the whole series, which is called End Times Survival Guide. It is 15 parts. This week I'm teaching it in five parts, but the series itself is 15 parts. It is just jam-packed with revelation about the end times and what's going to happen in society at the end of the age. And the reason we're studying this is because the Holy Spirit wants us to be prepared and not fall victim to the spirit of the age. So you need to order this. And it comes with a study guide that is enormous. It's 150 pages of information that you can read while you're seeing or listening to the series. And right now I'm also offering you my book called Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. In Matthew 24, Jesus enumerated signs we would see as we come to the end of the age because he wanted us to know where we are prophetically in time. He wants us to know. That's why I wrote this book for you. Signs 
You'll see just before Jesus comes, please order yours today. Or you can order my book, which I'm going to be reading from today quite a bit, called Last Days Survival Guide. The foreword is by Perry Stone. The subtitle says, A Scriptural Handbook to Prepare You for These Perilous Times. I wrote these books for you. So if you don't have them, please order them. And you ought to order two, because this is definitely something you're going to want to share with someone else. And please remember that if you need prayer, we're here for you. And we want to pray for you at Rick Renner Ministries. We believe in prayer. And what a thrill it is when the phone rings or when your email shows up in our inbox and you tell us how to pray for you. We will really pray for you and release our faith. But I want you to reach for your Bible today. We have so much material to cover. And we're going to return to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, where the Apostle Paul writes, and he says in the King James Version, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And I told you that the RIV says, You emphatically and categorically need to know with unquestionable certainty that in the very end of days, when time has sailed to its last port and no more time remains for the journey, that last season will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times that will be emotionally difficult for people to bear. That is a literal translation of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It is the RIV. But today we're going to begin in verse 2, which is where we stopped yesterday. And when you come to verse 2, the Holy Spirit begins to enumerate the signs that will develop in society at the end of the age. And in verse 2, he says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. This phrase, lovers of their own selves, is such a bizarre Greek word because it is the Greek word philautos, which is a compound of two words, the word philos and the word altos. The word philos means to love to be fond of. It denotes a love, fondness, attraction, or romantic feelings that one normally would have for someone else. But the second part of the word is the word autos, which means oneself. And when you compound the two words together, it forms the word phil autos, which means a love of self. And it actually describes an inordinate self-love, a self-preoccupation, or one in love with and consumed with himself. It is one that is self-absorbed, self-focused. It depicts an inordinate self-love. Certainly, we ought to love ourselves. But that's not what this is talking about. This word tells us that an end-time society will become narcissistic, self-consumed, off-balance, and faulty at its core. And because this is the fundamental problem with society, all of society will begin to lean off balance. And I always think about the leaning tower of Pisa in Pisa, Italy. When they begin to build it, the building began to lean. Rather than correct it in the beginning, they just kept building and they tried to correct it as it was leaning more and more and more. And today it's worldwide known as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's going to continue to lean because it's faulty at its foundation. And because society is faulty when it comes to the issue of self-love, everything else in this chapter is a result of that faulty foundation. When society is self-focused, self-absorbed, narcissistic, everything else becomes wrong. And that's why we next find the word Covetous. The word covetous is the Greek word phil arguras, which is also a very bizarre word. It is a compound of the word philos and the word arguras. The word philos again denotes love, fondness, attraction, and romance. The word arguras is the Greek word for silver or money, but when you compound the two words together, it forms the Greek word phil arguras, which depicts an inordinate love of or an abnormal preoccupation with money or material possessions, or it depicts a society that has become self-absorbed. Now, I want to read to you from page 76 in my book called Last Day's Survival Guide. Listen to this. Wow, this is so powerful. Page 76 tells us. Let me find page 76. Page 76 says, In ancient Greece, this word, covetous, commonly depicted individuals who had money, but they were so self-absorbed with their own wants, they refused to share their resources and wealth with others. Hence the age-old 
ideas of self-embellishment and greediness are conveyed in this Greek word that the Holy Spirit uses in this verse. It denotes one that has an insatiable desire to always have more, more, and more, and we must guard ourselves from ever falling prey to this covetous tendency that will be entrenched in society at the very end of the age. It is vital for us to determine that first and foremost, we will dedicate our resources to God and stay ready to give to any task that He puts into our hands. Wow! But the Holy Spirit promises at the end of the age, people will give to the altar of self. Listen to this. In the ancient pagan world, when a person came to worship a god, he brought sacrificial offerings to demonstrate his devotion to that god. These were often extravagant offerings. But because a last day's society will be self-fixated and self-worshipping, that end-time generation will extravagantly sacrifice at the altar of self and will demonstrate that they adore and love themselves more than anything else. And because the Holy Spirit describes this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 2, that is a people that are in love with themselves, it logically follows that they will also be phil arguras, which means they will be devoted to using their resources primarily for themselves and will know no limitations for self-aggrandizing and self embellishment. They will be self-lovers who invest more in themselves than in anything else. They will be the center of their own world. Hence, their resources will be consecrated to meeting their own self-cravings. That's what all of that means when the Bible uses the word covetous. But wait, we're not finished. Let's continue because the Holy Spirit continues in verse 2 and says, For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous and boasters. What does the word boasters mean? It is the Greek word alezan, which depicts one so committed to his own self-promotion and personal agenda that he's willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will have a positive effect on his position or situation. It means this person is doing and saying whatever he must to further his agenda, even if it clashes with his conscience or his convictions. And I have to read to you from page 88 in this book, Last Day's Survival Guide, because I cannot improve on what I've written. Listen to this. Today, we would call this word boasters situational ethics. That is the hurling away of fixed ethics or moral absolutes to embrace embrace a floating ethic code that is easily adapted to whatever one deems is necessary. A good example of this would be politicians who change their ethics and policies to fix, fit whatever the population wants to hear them say. A person with this mindset will nearly do or say anything that is needed to further his agenda, even if it clashes with his conviction, his conscience, or truth. And unfortunately today, this amoral philosophy is being proliferated in the media, education, and in nearly every sphere of society. This way of thinking is being perpetuated in the education of children and young people in schools and universities. In addition, through the media and through every other possible avenue, the world is being aggressively pushed by progressives who believe they have the right to subject everyone else, including Christians, to their new moral code. Those who believe and stick with the Word of God and refuse to go the way of the world have already been awakened to the reality that they are on a collision course with a culture in decline because so-called progressives are hurling away fixed ethics and moral absolutes and are trying to move society to a floating moral ethic code. All of that is in this word, which really here, The Greek word alazon is translated boasters, but it really depicts those that are willing to throw away every moral ethic, do whatever they have to do to further their agenda. It really describes situational ethics. And you know that today situational ethics are ruling society. But let's continue because the Holy Spirit then continues to say people will become proud. What does that mean? Well, there's a healthy pride, but there's also a very unhealthy pride. And that's what we find in this verse. This word proud is a translation of the Greek word 
hooperephanos, from the word hooper and the word phanos. The word hooper depicts something that is above or superior. The word phanos means to be manifested, but when you compound these two words together, they form the word hooperephanos, which paints the picture of a person who sees himself above the rest of the crowd. One who is arrogant, haughty, high and mighty, impudent and insolent. One who thinks he is intellectually advantaged above everyone else. It is the attitude that today is especially seen in media, politics and the courts by those who snootily vaunt themselves as the new vanguards of society. Is the Holy Spirit accurate? My friend, he was speaking 2,000 years in advance describing what would take place in society at the very end of the age. But I want to read to you from page 103 so you'll really understand what this word proud means. The Holy Spirit went on to tell us that an anti-God, anti-Bible, end-time society will display uh, we know better than you attitude at the end of the age. What an accurate description for those of us that are seeing all of this take place in the world today. This Greek word, us, which is translated proud, is especially seen in the media, the political world, and the courts in which many snootily vaunt themselves as the new vanguards of society. These leaders see themselves as a more sophisticated set of people than the rest of us, touting themselves as the rightful agenda setters for society, for culture, and for the rest of the world. This is not true of everybody, so I don't want to exaggerate, but many are abusing their positions to force their own liberal and progressive views and agendas on the rest of us. From their public platforms in the media and in Hollywood, their podiums in the courtroom and their lecterns in the university classrooms, they hotly mock, sneer, disdain, disparage, and scorn people they deem to be relics of the past because they're staying true to their biblical convictions. These agendas setters see anyone who holds fast to past moral codes and beliefs as a hindrance to the new world they want to create. And the Bible describes them as being proud, but it really describes people that are snooty and who mock and sneer at others. But wait, we're not finished. Let's continue because the Holy Spirit then goes on to say that they will become blasphemers. The word blasphemer is a translation of the Greek word blasphemeo, which means to slander, to accuse, or to speak against. But generally, on a broader way, it means to speak derogatory words for the purpose of injuring or harming one's reputation. It signifies profane, foul, unclean language, and it can refer to blaspheming the design, but broader it denotes derogatory speech intended, listen to this, derogatory speech intended to defame, injure, or harm another's reputation. The broader meaning includes debasing, derogatory, nasty, shameful, ugly speech, or behavior intended to humiliate or to put someone else down. We are seeing this today in the media, to be sure. And I want to read to you from page 106 in this book, Last Day's Survival Guide. Listen to this. Wow, this is so amazing to me. The word blasphemy denotes foul language, including curse words, but it also includes blasphemous behavior, a point that is important, for all blasphemy is not spoken. Some demonstrations of this word are behavioral or in graphic form, yet they're nonetheless blasphemous. Isn't that amazing? Has there ever been a time in our age when uncivil parties and political parties and various warring ideologies have been more uncivil and blasphemous, nasty in their words and in their behavior? Shocking is the only word I can think of to describe the embarrassing public behavior of politicians that displays such a sharp dissent from respectful disagreement to an ugly mess of intolerance and mud slinging, and to make it worse, a widespread weaponizing of the media is being used to perpetuate this indecent assault. This is the type 
of debasing, derogatory, insulting, nasty, shameful, ugly speech or behavior designed to humiliate that is conveyed by the Greek word blasphemeo in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. My friends, the Holy Spirit is so accurate and He foretold all of this in advance, not to scare us, but to prepare us for what was coming. But then He goes on and says, children will become disobedient to parents. Wow. The word disobedient is the Greek word apathes, but it is formed the word, from the word patho. The word patho means to persuade or to convince, but when it is translated into the Greek word apathes, it means unpersuadable, uncontrollable, unleadable, no longer able to persuade, to control, lead, or exercise authority over. It depicts a loss of control, a lack of ability to persuade or to lead. And here the Holy Spirit claims that at the very end of the age, parents will begin to lose their parental rights and authority in the lives of their children. Because children will claim to possess their own rights they will reject their parents' leadership and assert they have their own rights to make decisions for themselves. And I have to read to you from page 115 in this amazing book. Listen to this. Wow. This is just amazing to me. We've already seen the foremost characteristic of a last generation will be that they will be lovers of their own selves. When society is self-focused and self-absorbed, people become self-centered and selfish. This includes children who have been indoctrinated in school by liberal propaganda that they are in charge of their own lives and destinies, have their own rights, and should not allow their parents to enforce rules or tenets of faith on them that they don't find to be agreeable. The entire propaganda which is being today taught to children and to students in universities says, you are your own master. Your parents do not even have the right to tell you morally what is right and what is wrong. Who would have ever imagined that we would see this in our time? But that is precisely what we are seeing. My friends, the Holy Spirit knew 2,000 years in advance exactly what was going to take place. And I would translate 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, so far like this. Men will be self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, and self-consumed, and in love with themselves more than anyone else. As a result of this self-love, they will be driven to obtain more and more and more. These boasters are so committed to their own agenda that they're willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will get them the position, advantage, or goal they desire. They are arrogant, haughty, impudent, snooty, and insolent. They disdain, mock, slander, and speak ill of anyone that stands in the way of their ideology and freely use foul language. And in this climate, parents will no longer be able to persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over their children. That is amazing, and we're just getting started, so we're going to close here for today, but we're going to start here tomorrow, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. We are living in the last of the last days. That means you will see and experience bizarre developments that no other generation has witnessed. How do you protect your family, your children, and your grandchildren from the evil being spread through all media, education, Hollywood, and the courts? With the Bible at your side and the Holy Spirit as your guide, you can sidestep every landmine the enemy has planted and walk into victory. God wants you to be anointed and victorious, regardless of an ever-darkening world. But you need to know what God says about these end times. In Rick's Last Day Survival Guide, you'll learn what the Holy Spirit prophesied about the end of the age, the major signs that we are in the wrap-up of the age, steps to stay free and victorious in this end time season. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24, you'll learn how to reach inside yourself to stir up the fire of God that is in you. In addition, right now you can order the companion books, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes for just $15 and Last Day's Survival Guide for only $25. There is so much information in the New Testament about end-time events that we cannot claim ignorance on this subject. And the scriptures tell us how to live victoriously through this end-time season. Don't miss this special offer, the series, Last Day's Survival Guide, and the companion books, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes, and Last Day's Survival Guide. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. 
Call or go online now. Friend, we have an urgent need in our ministry, and today I'm asking you to pray about being a part of meeting that urgent need. We are out of space in our Tulsa office because so many people are reaching out to us for prayer, for support, and for resources. We're even using containers on the backside of our property to store supplies because we have no more space in our building. Our pastoral partner care department is taking calls from morning to evening from people whose lives are being impacted and who are reaching out to us for prayer and support. And in Moscow, our TV studio has become too small because we're now producing five to seven TV programs every day. We need a new ministry home in Tulsa, and we need a new studio in Moscow. Altogether, it comes to about 50,000 square feet, which comes to about $120 a square foot for everything, including the buildings, the furniture, the TV equipment, absolutely everything that we need. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus gave us the command, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We believe in the Great Commission and we're doing our part to obey it. But we need more space so we can more effectively minister to the people that God is bringing to us. And I'm asking you today about becoming a part of the giving team to meet this urgent need in our ministry to purchase a new ministry home in Tulsa and to construct a new TV studio in Moscow, and together we can do this. Would you please ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you to do? And I'm waiting to hear from you. I am so glad you've been with me today, and we are flying through this information because there is so much revelation in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and that's why I want you to order the entire series so you can hear it and hear it and hear it and really get this teaching down deep inside you. And the series is 15 parts, and it comes with a study guide that is 150 pages. And right now, we're also offering you my book, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes, and we're also offering you my book called Last Day's Survival Guide. And I want to remind you that when you become a partner with our ministry, we will send you a package of books as our way of saying welcome to our partner family. A partner is someone who regularly gives to our ministry to help us take this teaching to people all over the world. People are crying out, God, please send me someone who can teach me the Bible in a way that I can trust it. We believe that that's our part. And when you become a partner with us, you help us take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the world. If you're already a partner, thank you. And if not, please become a partner. You can do all of this by going online or by giving us a call right now. And please let us know how to pray for you. We want to pray for you. But Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you did not give us any of this information to scare us, but to prepare us so we would know what was coming in the future. Thank you that you love us so much. You want us to be prepared. We embrace the Word of God. Help us to open our eyes and know how to respond to this information to protect ourselves and to protect those that we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, it's been so good to be with you today, but I'll be back tomorrow. We're going to pick up right here. Until then, remember... Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Power.